Okay, so the masked professor is on the air once more. And welcome to today's class, Chapter 11, Managing Project Teams. I'm your genial host, Harry Whiting. Uh, of course, our map of where we are in our book. So, we are going to talk about the key characteristics of a high-performance project team distinguish the different stages of team development, understand the uh, impacting situational factors that have effect on a project team development, identify strategies for developing a high performance project team, and distinguish the, uh, between functional conflict and dysfunctional conflict, and what are the strategies that we can use for encouraging functional conflict and discouraging dysfunctional conflict. And of course we want to understand the challenges of managing virtual project teams. Um, of course uh, in today's environment that's particularly important. We'll also want to recognize the different pitfalls that can happen to a project management team. All right, so we'll talk about the five-stage team development model. What are our situational factors that affect teams? <laughs> development, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not a well-placed uh, 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 situation there. Building the high-performance project teams, managing virtual project teams, and again, our project team pitfalls. So, when we're talking about high-performing teams, we're talking about people that are doing their jobs and doing it well. So, very often what we talk about in this regard is synergy. Uh, when having different members come together and create something that is larger than the effect they would have individually, that's what we call positive synergy. If our different project teams come together and the results we get are less than that those we would have gotten from the individuals on their own. We call that negative synergy. All right, so what are the characteristics of a high performing team? Well, first of all, sharing a sense of common purpose. This is something that we want to develop in every project team that we're associated with. The second is effective use of the individual talents and expertise. We want to make sure we're placing people where they are able to exercise that talent and make our team better as a result. We want to have balanced and shared roles amongst the team members so that no one feels like they're having to do more work than other people um, or that, uh, uh, that they're having to carry the entire load. Of course, we always want a problem-solving focus um, to solve problems, we want to, our teams to have a, a learning uh, orientation. 
where we are learning as we solve the problems. We want to accept the differences that we're going to have of opinion and expression. Uh, some people tend to be uh, very reserved. They, uh, uh, they don't say a lot. Whereas others are more flamboyant. Someone like, oh, I don't know, me, for example. Um, and uh, express themselves in very dramatic ways that may uh, uh, at times freak people out. Uh, we want to encourage risk-taking and creativity. Um, it's uh, some people like to manage where everything is very white bread, everything is very uh, even, um, but when you do that, you kind of get white uh, bread results. Uh, uh, I always want to encourage my team to try and reach try and go for those challenge goals. Be creative about problem solving. We want to set high personal performance standards. And we want everyone to identify with the team, right? Uh, they don't have to be uh, uh, everybody from a cookie cutter kind of mold. But we want everyone to understand they're part of a team, their job on the team is important, and how that works. All right, so we talk about the five-stage team development model. Uh, in stage one, we're, uh, it, we have what we call forming. In other words, we're putting the team together. So our project activity is orienting everyone to the project. The group project is we're testing each other and discovering our dependencies uh, in the inner group, in the inner group uh, uh, model. Stage two is storming. There may be emotional responses to the demands of the project, uh, and uh, uh, that's fine. We want to try and work out as much of the intra-group conflict as we can at that time, and there's usually some. It's very rare that we put together a team and there's never any kind of conflict or um, interpersonal uh, issues. Stage three is what we call norming. In that uh, stage, we're having exchange of relevant information. And we're starting to develop a group cohesion. Uh, Stage four is performing. Our solution is emerging, right? We've brought the team together. We've started working together. We've defined our specifications. We've uh, defined our roles within the group. Um, people have been working together and working on what is the solution. And we're starting to see at least the shape of it. So our functional roles are emerging. And remember that our functional roles are not necessarily the same as our formal roles. Um, very often we have a situation where our, uh, uh, where people who have uh, some of the lower level jobs may be showing great leadership even though they don't have a formal leadership 
position within the group. Okay, so we go through our performing stage. We uh, uh, finish the uh, project, and then we get to five, uh, stage five, which is a journey. And that's where we, we say our goodbyes, we pat ourselves on the back for having done a good job with our project, and everyone goes off to their, the next phase of their work life. All right, so what are the conditions that are going to favor development of our high performance project team. Well, one thing is if we have a smaller group, they list 10 or fewer team members. It is true that the fewer team members we have, the easier it is to make the personal relationships, develop uh, the relationships between the team members although I don't know whether 10 is the perfect number. Voluntary team membership, if people ask to be on the team rather than uh, they're just drafted to be on the team, that is definitely going to influence how they feel about the project and about working. Well, of course, it helps if they are on the team all the way through the project. And sometimes we even have project teams that are kept together through many projects and develop very close relationships uh, because of that. Of course, having everyone assigned full time to the team really helps. It, is not easy when you have a divided loyalty. Oh, I'm working half time with the team, half time at my regular job. Um, sometimes makes it very difficult because then your regular manager is uh, upset. They can't give you as much work as they're used to. Uh, maybe you can't keep up with the same volume of work. Uh, so. It really helps a lot if you are able to leave that, come and work on the team. And if we have an organizational culture of cooperation and trust, that makes things very, very much easier. Uh, if you come from an organization that is not used to trusting or cooperating each individual department with each other or so on, then it's going to be hard to develop cooperation and trust within the project team. And of course, that's not something that we want. Okay, more conditions. Uh, the members uh, report solely to the project manager. Well, that goes back to having full-time assignment to the project, where your, your loyalties aren't divided because you're expected to work in more than one area on more than one project at a time. All relevant functional areas are represented on the team. And we want to make sure that they're represented by people that can truly speak for that functional area, right? That they don't just assign uh, uh, somebody uh, because they're like, oh, they're the most worthless ones here, send them to do that. Having a compelling objective, something that we know is going to make a difference in the organization, to the organization's strategy, to uh, the organization's future, obviously 
is going to uh, cause people to, to be more invested and want to work on it harder. And our members being in close communication with each other. On a project, we're often going to be doing things where thing, uh, where different parts of the project, the work packages or different functions, are going to cut across different functional areas. So we want people communicating. How do we do this so that both marketing and manufacturing uh, get what they need and, uh, and get everything in the best possible way for them? Okay, so when uh, uh, this is kind of an illustration of, uh, of the team development. We have the start of our project here, so our x-axis is a timeline, and our y-axis is performance from low to high. We have our first meeting, everyone's getting together, we're going through our stage one, or our phase one, of forming. That is going to transition into our phase two of everyone getting to know each other, working together, until we get to the completion of the project, by which time we're hoping to be performing at a very high level. You'll have to pardon me if this illustration is uh, a little hard to read or see. Uh, it was so tiny on the original slide, I had to enlarge it. All right, so we're creating our high performance project team. We recruit our team members, and then we're going to conduct our project meetings. We're going to establish a team identity. Uh, part of that might be uh, creating a team name, uh, a team mascot. Uh, sometimes that, uh, sometimes the team members think that's kind of juvenile and they don't want to do that. Uh, but sometimes uh, uh, that can be a necessary part of the process in creating our high performance team. Creating a shared vision though is something that we have to do. We have to make sure everyone understands why we're doing this project, why it's important, and why it's important that we do a good job and uh, and function as a high performance team. Within that, we want to build a reward system. The reward system can be very elaborate to pretty simple and straightforward. Um, we want to manage our decision making. Uh, we want to make sure that we're making good decisions. Uh, some decisions are going to need to be um, uh, group decisions. Everybody's like, is everyone on board with this decision? Yeah, we like it. Or, or no, oh my God, what are you thinking? And some decisions, of course, will end up in the hands of the project manager uh, to do. So we have to manage the conflict within the team. Inevitably, there will be conflict, even between people who are good friends. We have to rejuvenate the project team. In other words, there are going to be low points. Things didn't work out the way we thought they would. 
Uh, everybody's tired because we had to work over the weekend um, uh, because that was the only time we could use the testing lab or some other facility. Uh, so there's always going to be that need to rejuvenate the project team. And following these, we're looking for superior performance. All right, so when we're recruiting our project members, things that are going to affect our recruiting are, first of all, the importance of the project. Uh, nobody uh, is going to want to be on a project that is regarded as unimportant and that nobody is going to notice. No, they want to be on the projects where there is a big goal that we are really going to accomplish something. And, we're, and as a result, being on that project is going to enhance our, uh, our credibility, our uh, position within the company. The management structure used within the project is going to af affect whether people want to be recruited or whether they ask to be recruited for the project. If our project manager is known as a micromanager, a lot of people may not want to be on that project. They're, they're kind of like, no, I know I'm good at such and such, but I don't want to constantly be harangued and, and harassed about getting things done. How do we recruit? Well, asking for volunteers. Um, in fact, I would say that would include going around to the different functional areas where we need people and asking people, hey, we have this project that's kind of important uh, for the company. Would you like to be on that? Would you like to volunteer for that project? All right, so how do we know who to recruit? Well, we're going to look for certain things in these people. One of them is going to be problem-solving ability. Even though we may have spent a long time putting together a project plan, if you think no problems will ever arise, you're fooling yourself. Right? So we want people that have problem-solving ability. That if a problem comes up, they're not totally flummoxed and don't know what to do. Well, another important idea is availability. If they're not going to be available, they're not going to be able to help us with the project. Uh, we want people that have the technological expertise in their area. No matter what that area is, uh, if it's manufacturing, if it's marketing, if it is um, uh, sales, if it, whatever it is, we need people that have that expertise and can bring that into focus on the project. Credibility, well, we want people that we can count on to be there, to work hard, to do their job. We don't want to be recruiting um, people that are flakes. Political connections, if they uh, know the President of the United States, no, no, wait, no, not that kind of political connections. Um, But it would be good, when it's possible, to bring in people that are connected in the company. Um, it's, people always have different talents. And um, 
Personally, I like to cultivate relationships with as many people as possible within the organization. You can never tell when their help might be uh, the crucial factor in your project. And that's how we should approach our recruiting of members. We want people with ambition. Why with ambition? Because then their success is tied to the project's success. People that just want to stay in the same job the rest of their lives, well, they may be very talented. They may have expertise in their area. Uh, and we may even want to recruit them. But it's always good to have those ambitious people that really want to push ahead, that really want to get things done so that uh, because their success is going to be all of our success. We want them to have uh, initiative and energy. Uh, right? Uh, when, um, when I manage a project, I never, uh, uh, I never, um, uh, criticize people for taking initiative and pushing things through. Um, uh, I want them to do that. I want them to know that is okay. I do want them to understand the limits that they need to stay in when they do that. You know, don't commit a bunch of the uh, project's budget to something without making sure that we've got that money uh, and that it's going to be for that purpose or that we can reallocate it for that purpose. Uh, energy, um, I, we're talking about a personal kind of energy and it's a lot easier to work with people who have a lot of energy, they want to get things done. Uh, those slug-like people are, can be somewhat frustrating to work with. And familiarity, um, well, we like to work with people that we know, that we've worked with before, that we understand. Um, one of the most awkward things in managing a project team can be when you have people on your team that you don't know, that you don't know their capabilities, you don't know what they're, uh, what they're like when they're working. All right, so for project team meetings, one of the very first things that we need to do is establish ground rules for the meeting. Um, and those will be very different depending on the different teams. Um, uh, for example, uh, one ground rule uh, that I like is uh, don't interrupt people uh, because sometimes the shy people get run over by those that uh, interrupt and they never get to make their point, they never get to be heard. Everybody wants to be heard. Planning decisions as much as possible, we want to make those with the team. Sometimes a decision will be thrust on us from top management or our, pro our sponsor or the customer, but as often as possible, we're going to want to make those decisions in the context of the team. We want to keep track of those decisions so that we know what our outcomes are, uh, right? And sometimes uh, a decision will be a wrong decision in retrospect. Uh, we don't deliberately make wrong decisions, uh, but we want to make sure that we're keeping track. 
what happened when we made this decision? We want to manage change. Uh, we're always going to have change within a project, but we want to manage that through the process that we've talked about in this class before. Right, that we have a formal system. We're not just wildly changing things all the time. We want to think about our relationships and the decisions that arise from those. Uh, relationships within the team, relationships between our team and the organization or the team and the top management or the team and the customer, all of these we have to, uh, uh, we have to uh, manage uh, as we go along. We want to establish team norms. Uh, in other words, um, the formal word for kind of unwritten rules is mores. It comes from the same root as the word morals. Those are norms. Um, and sometimes um, it's, um, it can be extremely embarrassing when someone who doesn't know the norms violates them and then everybody's kind of like, oh my God, did you see what he did? Oh no. And then we're going to have to manage our subsequent meetings, right? So all of these things are things that as a project manager, you're going to have to do. All right, so what are some norms of high-performance teams? Well, first of all is confidentiality. We're very careful about who we share information with. That we don't share information outside the team unless everybody has agreed to it and everybody understands. So, it's okay to be in trouble, but it's okay, uh, but it's not okay to surprise everybody else. So, if we're going to have trouble reaching a deadline or a milestone, the whole uh, the project manager and the team members must be notified. Um, I have worked on teams where uh, <clears throat> I've worked on teams where this kind of information was not shared, uh, and as a result, <coughs> as a result. Uh, people were doing work that turned out to be pointless. <coughs> we mustn't try to fake our way through any problems or issues. We must be sure that we're being straight up with our team members, um, our fellow teammates, our project manager, our sponsor. <coughs> okay, we agree to disagree, allowing discussion, even disagreement within the group is okay. But once, once a decision has been made, we have to keep moving forward. We don't want to let that bog us down because someone keeps bringing up, well, if we had done this, that, or, well, it doesn't matter. We didn't do it. 
respect for outsiders, uh, sometimes it's very high profile to be on a project team. But don't flaunt that. Well, I'm on the XYZ project. No. Come on, man. Uh, today you're flying high. Is that going to be the same tomorrow? We want to work hard, but we also want to have fun. Some people think these are not compatible. I disagree with that. We want to enjoy our work even as we're working hard and we want to make sure that we take time to have fun as well so for example I've worked on uh, many teams where uh, we have a regular night uh, out and not everybody necessarily goes um, but everybody has an invitation to go and a lot of people go and that way they can blow off steam oh you know oh the manager over in such and such an area uh, <coughs> uh, whatever all right we do want to be sure that we're establishing our team identity one thing is effective use of meetings this is so important we always want to have an agenda we always want the project manager or the assistant project manager whoever's running the meeting to keep focused on what is on the agenda I've worked with many people who were fine people uh, uh, were good managers but could not manage meetings the meetings would drift and they would end up taking three or four times as long as they should have because they didn't keep the focus on what's important co-locating our team members it's very hard to be a coherent team when I'm here I've got a guy who is working in the next building. Uh, three of the members are working in yet another building. Three guys are in the lab. If we can all be in the same location, that makes communication uh, and uh, very, very fast. As opposed to, oh, wait, we've made a decision over here we start working in that direction the other team members don't know that though and they may be, still be pursuing the old direction creation of a project team name this is so, something i always think is important and uh, <clears throat> i was the assistant project manager on a project where the project manager just could not understand why I was so insistent that we had to have a team name. And, um, he thought it was kind of silly. Although he ended up naming the team. Get the team together to do something together. Okay, uh, that's too many togethers. That's more than is in our uh, presentation again every Wednesday we go to happy hour uh, we have lunch together once a week something that we do together that's not necessarily work uh, but can be a, a chance to bitch about work or uh, or blow off steam is something very good and team rituals on athletics teams you often see this uh, you know everybody puts their hand in and goes hey oh or 
whatever. <laughs> um, having team rituals creates an atmosphere of normalcy that uh, that we want. That things are all right. That we are doing everything right. Okay, so what do we need to have an effective project vision? Our illustration here is of an old-fashioned oil lamp. We have to communicate. We have to have a sense of our strategy. We want to inspire others. And we want to have passion for what we're doing. To me, there is nothing that I hate more than having a job where when I get up in the morning, I'm like, oh, holy crap. I've got to drag myself to work. I've got to deal with it. Oh, dear. Oh, I hate that feeling. I have quit many jobs because they inspire exactly that feeling in me. All right. So, I mentioned having reward systems before. What is our group reward system going to be? Who is going to get what as an individual reward? Um, people are motivated by so many different things. Um, and part of that is the old-fashioned Maslow's needs hierarchy, uh, where when you're young and you're just starting out, what really motivates you is money. Right? Because you don't have any. And you want some. Right? But you get a bit older and what motivates you isn't money as much anymore. Uh, having money is nice, but, uh, but part of it is the ability to have more control over what you do and how you do it, right? So people are at different stages in their lives. They have different intrinsic and extrinsic reward systems that they respond to. Some people really respond to praise. Uh, a pat on the back is uh, really uh, a big thing for them. Other people are embarrassed by being praised. Their, uh, what they want as rewards is different. So that all goes into what makes a reward have lasting significance. Right? Is it that they get a plaque? Um, that they can hang up on the wall of their office at their home? Right? For some people, that means a lot. Um, uh, is it that they have been acknowledged in front of their peers uh, to have done a, a major uh, part in the job? What is it that people want? Right? As a project manager, you're going to have to learn how to recognize what that is. Well, what are some ways we can recognize individual performance? Letters of commendation. Those are uh, things that uh, we can award them that go into their uh, uh, human resources packet. 
um, that uh, that are kind of a lasting mark uh, for their career. Public recognition for outstanding work. Some people are very shy. They don't want public recognition. Others eat that up with a spoon. Getting a desirable job assignment. Right? That's one that really motivates me. Getting to do something interesting. Getting to make a difference. Having more personal flexibility. Some people um, well, for example, um, I tend to be a morning person. Uh, I will be at work as early as six in the morning if I have a lot to do. And I love that time before everybody gets here when I am just getting stuff done and getting it out of the way. Other people are not more mean people. They don't want to show up even as early as 8 in the morning. They want to show up much later in the day, but they may be somebody who works extremely late, right? Having flexibility of time, being able to take off an afternoon to go watch your kids' softball game, or to uh, be able to take off part of the, uh, the middle of the day to go have lunch with your spouse, right? These are the kind of things that uh, a lot of people find very rewarding. All right. One of the things that we're going to have to do as project managers is we're going to have to help direct the decision-making process. So, First of all, we're going to have a problem or a situation. We have to identify that and understand what it is. At certain times, people see the problem or the situation. They don't really look at it closely enough to understand what it is. What is the root cause? What are, um, well, that gets into our next one. What are the possible solutions, right? We want to generate as many alternatives as we can and encourage people to throw out anything that might be uh, workable because one thing that I've learned in problem solving and method improvement Sometimes what sounds like the stupidest idea when you first hear it turns out to be the most brilliant idea. All right, so we've got our alternatives. We examine them closely. Then we reach a decision. We say, we are going to do this. We're going to do X followed by Y followed by Z. And then we follow up on that. We make sure that the decision is going down that path. All right. In any group of human beings, you're going to have conflict. Even people that are extremely close. In fact, sometimes, especially in a group of people that are very close. Um, think of your brothers and sisters, for example. Very often there's conflict there. We want in, uh, to encourage functional conflict. 
Functional conflict is conflict that is bringing things out in the open and allowing them to be examined and weighed in the balance. So, we want to encourage dissent by asking tough, tough questions. I think we should do such and such. Okay, well, why do you think we should do such and such instead of this other idea that we have over here? We want people with different points of view. I love it when my team is diverse. Not necessarily diverse racially or ethnically, although I've found that to be very helpful. When they have diverse points of view, right? When we have Democrats, Republicans, and Libertarians trying to decide how to solve a problem, I'm going to get the best answer. To designate someone to be a devil's advocate. This is actually an idea that started in the Catholic Church. They have an awful office for the devil's advocate so that they don't fall into the uh, trap of group think. They have somebody whose job it is to bring up conflicting views and solutions. And ask the team to consider an unthinkable alternative Sometimes that is a great way to spur them to think about what they really want and how they really want to solve a problem. <clears throat> Conflict can be great within a project team, but Sometimes we have dysfunctional conflict, right? It's not that the conflict is bringing in different ideas and different ways of thinking about something. It's that now it has devolved to um, uh, Joe hates Al, Al hates Joe, and all they're doing is sniping at each other and not actually doing anything uh, useful for us. So what do we do? Well, we can mediate the con conflict, see what we can do to make it better um, so that we don't have this. Uh, that can be with arbitration of the conflict. Maybe we can control the conflict. Okay, Al and Joe do not get along. <clears throat> I create a situation where they spend a lot less time in, uh, together. We can accept the conflict. Sometimes we just know we've got these people, they don't like each other. But boy, they're brilliant at their jobs. Um, and we're just going to have to accept that that is part of having those guys around. Or eliminate the conflict. Um, okay, Joe hates Al, Al hates Joe. You know what, we really have to have Joe, but I can, ma I can manage this project without Al. Um, now, of course, that's obviously a very last-ditch solution. Um, we don't want to just go around uh, uh, wildly getting rid of people. 
because it could damage their career, it could damage their self-esteem. Just creates damage. One thing that I've discovered in managing projects, managing businesses, is uh, my first approach is always, look, you don't have to love each other, but you have to talk to each other civilly and we have to get along while we're doing the job. After work, I don't care. Uh, that's always my first approach. Sometimes we have a conflict because an individual isn't pulling their weight. And very often in the, that kind of a situation, you may talk to them and they do okay or, or better for a while and then they start going back. Um, but sometimes it comes down to you end up having to fire them. And uh, one thing that I've discovered about that is when somebody has to be fired, it's usually not a surprise to them that they're not happy already. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember a friend of mine telling me, because he was the manager of uh, a, uh, a law partnership. And so he was the guy in charge of firing people. And I said, uh, but you're such a nice guy. Why are you the guy in charge of firing people? He said, because I'm the one who can fire them in a way that they now think this is the greatest opportunity of their life. <clears throat> All right, so what are our sources of conflict during the, the project life cycle? Well, during the defining pay, uh, phase, they can be the priorities, the procedures, the schedules. During planning, it can still be priorities and schedule and the procedures. It can also be the technical aspects of the workforce. During executing phase, it could be the schedule, it could be the technical means, it could be the workforce, and it could be the priorities. And delivery, it's almost always the schedule. Now, we shouldn't regard this as totally, uh, this is everything that could ever go wrong or be, uh, 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 be a source of conflict in uh, a project uh, uh, at all during the project life cycle or any other time. All right, well, I talked before about rejuvenating the project team. Some projects are going to be on a very tight timeline. They're going to be very difficult projects to do. There could be all kinds of reasons. Uh, I worked many years in theater, and there, very often, we would be working many, many hours a week against tight deadlines. So, what are some of the informal techniques we could use? Well, in institute new rituals. Uh, uh, bring in some new ideas and get everyone involved. Take an off-site break as a team from the project. Uh, you know, one day uh, you're the project manager, say, all right, I'm taking everybody to lunch. Uh, we're going to go to this fancy restaurant over here, whatever. Whatever. 
view an inspirational message or movie, um, well, uh, that's one that works really well with me, I know. Um, uh, but I'm a kind of a sentimental, emotional guy, so uh, an inspirational movie, uh, I may be crying at the end. In fact, I remember I had one team where my assistant project manager would bet with people whether I would be crying uh, uh, during uh, my inspirational message to the team. Have our project sponsor give a pep talk. Again, we've got to have that shared vision. We, we've got to have inspiration. And particularly if we have a project sponsor that can bring that kind of uh, feeling, that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of uh, inspiration, oh yeah, have them come in and give a pep talk. <clears throat> All right, what are some more formal techniques? Well, one is to have uh, a team building session. Uh, ordinarily, we want somebody to come in from outside um, who uh, essentially is neutral. Um, Uh, team building exercises are often little exercises that uh, are kind of pointless in themselves, but uh, you know it gives everyone a chance to to laugh together and <coughs> kid each other. <coughs> oh, you looked pretty silly when you were having to hold that rag doll and recite the Gettysburg address, or you know whatever. Uh, that kind of goes into our next one, having an outside activity that gives us all an intense common experience to help develop our social uh, aspect of our team. Uh, you know, so maybe have uh, our project uh, uh, team uh, have a softball team and we're against other project teams or uh, different functional areas uh, of uh, our organization. All right. One thing that we're going to see more and more in the future are virtual project teams. Teams where our people may be working not just in separate buildings, but in separate towns, cities, even countries. So we've got the challenge of how do we develop trust in a virtual team? Well, one thing is the exchange of social information. Right? Um, you get everybody to stand up and say, uh, Hi, I'm uh, Harry Whiting. Uh, uh, I'm an industrial engineer. Uh, and I like reading books about alternate history. Right? Somebody else hears that that also likes alternate history. And they're like, oh, yeah. Um, you know, or... Or, I like woodworking. I like, uh, um, uh, I like going to garage sales, whatever. We also want to make sure the roles are clear for every team member in this situation. Because because we're not going to be together, because we can't just uh, wheel our chair a few feet over 
and say, hey, Bill, what, uh, uh, you know, I'm working on this. Uh, what do you think about, right? We're going to have to be able to, uh, uh, we're going to have to be able to know exactly what you should be working on and how that fits with everybody else's work. Another cha uh, challenge is finding an effective pattern of communication, right? So we can't let team members just suddenly not show up or not be present. Uh, we want to make sure we have a code of conduct so that we know how people are going to behave within our virtual project team. What are our clear norms and our protocols for bringing, uh, bringing up the assumptions we're working under and resolving the, pro uh, the conflicts that arise because some people have one assumption, some people have another assumption, and those assumptions don't go together. Uh, using uh, video technology, electronics technology to verify the work that they've been doing and share the pain. Uh, at your uh, uh, virtual meetings, have a thing of, uh, well, what are the problems you're encountering? Uh, what, what do we need to do to help you have less problems in this area or that area or whatever area. All right, as I said, we might be talking about a project where we have people in multiple countries that are working together. So we may have a thing where we have people that are working at wildly different times because they're so far apart. Um, uh, and here we have an example where we have the United States each East Coast time versus Australian time versus uh, the time in Scotland. Uh, and so we look for what are going to be times that we can have uh, uh, we can have meetings together uh, that aren't going to be um, uh, where people in one country have to get up at three in the morning to be in the meeting or things of this nature. Any time we have a project there are pitfalls, problem areas that we can fall into. One of them would be groupthink. Uh, as the old saying reminds us, when everybody thinks alike, nobody thinks very much. Right? I always encourage dissent and uh, independent thinking in, on my teams, even to the point where I've had uh, bosses attend my meetings, and then afterwards they're like, how can you let that person talk to you like that? <laughs> uh, well, I don't care. I care that we get results. <clears throat> um, so groupthink can be a problem, and very often we get into that because everybody has the same background, uh, or it can be that they know the boss doesn't react well if, um, if people challenge their ideas. Well, nothing will create groupthink faster than that. 
bureaucratic bypass syndrome, um, the kind of, I think of that as being the not my job uh, kind of idea. That people get into a thing of, oh, well, I don't have to do that. That's not my area. That's not my job. Um, uh, that needs to be, we need to send that problem over to Rosalie. That's her area. No. Let us take on problems and solve them. Team spirit becomes team infatuation. Um, kind of a jingoism uh, that uh, we are so good we can never do anything wrong. Well, boy, when we start thinking like that, we're definitely in danger of thinking wrong. Going native, well, look, we want to look at the best thinkers can get along in many different cultures, right? Uh, if you can only get along in one culture, and again, remember, culture is inherent in groups. It's not necessarily that because I'm here at Navajo Technical uh, University, uh, I am ingrained with the Navajo culture, right? Um, you want to be able to understand different cultures and get along with the different, uh, the different groups. But if you start becoming infatuated with, um, with one culture to the point that you start rejecting maybe even your native culture or uh, the culture of your company, that can become a problem. All right, well, here are the key uh, terms from today's uh, uh, lecture on chapter 11. Um, are there any questions? Of course there are no questions. I'm the only one here. Uh, Okay, and why we have this extra little, um, uh, this extra little uh, uh, agenda here, I am not sure. But you'll notice the agenda is broken up carefully, starts at 3 o'clock, 3.15 we have the overview, 3.30 we go over the ground rules, 3.45 meeting times, and 4 o'clock we adjourn. When you create agendas, do so realistically. And don't be afraid to cut people off who start going too deep into the weeds. Uh, uh, right? Uh, on the other hand, if, they're, uh, if they get up and they say a couple of sentences and they sit down, ask them to stand up. Ask questions. Draw more information out. We want to keep a meeting moving, but we also want to be sure that we're getting information that's needed from the meeting. Okay, well, that's it for today's class. Um, and if you have enjoyed this lecture half as much as I've enjoyed giving it, then I've got twice as much enjoyment out of it as you have. Have fun, and the mass professor is out.